Well, welcome to our viewers. Um, this conversation, this three-way conversation between myself, uh, Mintaro Oba, and Yuki Tatsumi, um, Stimson Zone, will be posted as a sort of a video addendum to a conversation that I will be having with Ambassador Ong Jung-guk, who was the chief delegate for the Republic of Korea in its ninth special measures agreement burden sharing talks in 2013 and 14. Our conversation uh, today will, will give a nice sort of comparative context um, between both the US, South Korea and US, Japan relationships involving cost sharing dynamics and, and beyond. Um, for those who don't know me, my name is Clint Work. I'm a Stimson Fellow. I'm leading congressional engagement on Korean peace and security issues. Um, I have two speakers who I alluded to before. One is Mintaro Oba. Uh, Mintaro is a former U.S. State Department official, I believe from 2012 to 2016. That's correct. He specialized in the Korean Peninsula and is also an expert commentator on U.S. foreign policy in the Asia Pacific region. While he was at State, he advised senior officials on key issues in U.S.-Korea relations, crafted strategic messaging to help advance U.S. interests in the region and the alliance, and worked closely with Korean diplomats in that process. His portfolio also included South Korea's diplomatic relations with Japan, China, and North Korea, economic and global issues in the U.S. ROC Alliance, as well as inter-Korean relations and unification issues. Uh, since his time in the State Department, he has published and spoken widely on these issues and is often quoted in such periodicals as the New York Times, the Washington Post, BBC, and many other major media outlets. Uh, Stimson's own, uh, Yuki Tatsumi, is a senior fellow and co-director of the East Asia program and director of the Japan program at the Stimson Center. Before joining Stimson, she worked as a research associate at the Center for Strategic and International Studies, or CSIS, and as a special assistant for political affairs at the Embassy of Japan in Washington. Uh, she's an expert on U.S.-Japan relations and regional relations, and has written and published extensively on alliance and regional issues. She's testified before Congress on the same, and in 2012 was awarded the Letter of Appreciation from the Ministry of National Policy of Japan for her contribution in advancing mutual understanding between the US and Japan. So I'm looking to both Mintaro and Yuki as uh, experts on sort of the American perspective in some of these issues. And then in Yuki's case, a bit on the Japanese perspective. Um, but I imagine because of their expertise and experience, they'll, they'll be able to comment um, on the areas that I'm asking each of them to comment on respectively. Um, with that in mind, I think we'll start with the, OSCO, the ongoing cost sharing negotiations between Washington and Seoul. And this will be a subject I discuss with Ambassador Huang. And I wanna ask uh, Mintaro a, a similar question that I'll ask Ambassador Huang, but I might just give a little context for viewers who might not be as up on the background. The previous ninth special measures agreement, which was negotiated uh, when Mintaro was serving at the State Department, was for five years, uh, from 2014 to 18. So it expired in the second year of uh, the Trump administration. And in that, the South Korean government had agreed to increase its annual contributions by 6%. Um, in relation to the previous eighth SMA, also increasing based on inflation each year throughout that SMA. Uh, when that expired, the Trump administration requested that Seoul double its annual contribution. Um, Seoul did not agree to this, and eventually they hammered out a one-year stopgap deal as the 10th SMA, uh, where Seoul agreed to increase its payment by about 8.2%. I believe. And, and this was really settled because it was in the lead up to the Hanoi summit. So there was a lot of pressure on the alliance to get the SMA at least squared away for a year as uh, diplomatic efforts ensued with, with Pyongyang. Um, but that expired late last year and the allies are once again in contentious burden sharing talks. And the Trump administration this time asked it not only to double but to quadruple its payments, to increase it by 300% to $4 billion annually. And Seoul um, has rejected that and agreed only to increase its payment by 13%. So they are very much uh, far apart in their positions at the moment um, with really no end in sight. 
President Trump himself rejected the 13% proposal uh, about a week ago. So I wanted to ask you, Mintaro, um, as you know from your experience, it's not uncommon uh, for Washington to ask for some level of increase from South Korea in cost sharing talks. But how surprising to you was the Trump administration's proposal, its initial one in 2018, and even more so today, um, and, and sort of as an addendum to that, when you were at the State Department and the Allies were negotiating the 9th SMA, which I know you did not negotiate firsthand, but you were privy to some of the discussions, was there discussion at that time during the Obama administration among American officials about asking Seoul to pay more beyond just the three categories that had, that had been part of the SMA since 1991, the labor costs for Korean workers in USFK, logistical costs, and construction for bases and other military facilities. Was there discussion at that time about asking Seoul to pay beyond that? Um, well, it, first of all, it's not unusual for the United States to take a maximalist posture in negotiations over burden sharing. Uh, I think the main difference between the Trump administration and the Obama administration is, uh, you know, we, we went from one particularly transactional piece of um, a very strategic alliance to making the SMA the centerpiece of a fundamentally transactional view of the U.S.-Korea alliance. And that has really informed the way uh, President Trump uh, the United States have ne negotiated this last SMA. Uh, the demands they've made are many times uh, what could be considered reasonable. Um, and uh, I think pr probably um, the $60 billion figure that was quoted at one point as what President Trump uh, wanted um, exceeds what the South South Koreans pay for their own defense. Um, so, so that just doesn't make sense. Um, and another thing is that one benefit of these agreements, uh, which have typically been for five years, um, is that there is certainty in the military alliance. Um, and the Trump administration has instead opted for these shorter term agreements, um, which which shows they have put more priority on the transactional element, uh, more priority on gaining leverage rather than um, strategic benefits or, or the benefits of ha having more certainty in the military alliance. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so in sum, yeah, uh, the Obama administration, um, like any other administration, certainly wanted the Koreans to pay more, um, is always seeking to get them to do more in support of their own defense. Um, not just with SMA, but uh, in terms of OPCON and defense sales and things like that. Um, but it was always within the context of a more strategic view of the alliance. Less transactional. Right. Just as a, as a quick follow on to that, because I know this is a question that I've been, I've been asked by Hill staffers, um, because it's sort of in the ether now is what is fair and equitable? Um, do you believe that the current SMA structure that's, that's been in place essentially since 1991, and it includes those three categories that I mentioned, you know, logistics, construction, and then wages for employees for USFK, Korean employees, is there a, should that remain in place? Or are we at a point now where you think um, it, we can move beyond just those categories is there a compromise formula between what the Trump administration is asking at you know this exorbitant demand, $4 billion, and the current uh, South Korean offer of 13% and essentially adhering to the SMA structure as constituted? Is there a compromise position? What, what does fair and equitable burden sharing actually look like? Well, even taking a very transactional view of the military alliance, there is room for uh, for a better way of doing things. Um, I think the SMA covers what it needs to, but we've always um, considered the Defense Alliance in total. We've considered defense sales. We've considered how much South Korea spends uh, in its own defense budget. Uh, we've considered capabilities that, that it has and it is seeking to get. Um, 
And so we should continue to closely coordinate with South Koreans on that. Um, I don't I don't see a need to fundamentally change the nature of SMA itself. So I don't want to put words in your mouth, but just for clarification for our viewers, when you before when you were saying that the Obama administration was approaching it, of course they would make demands, of course they'd have a maximalist position, but they would frame the the discussions more in a strategic context and the overall sort of strategic alliance in that way where in addition to just the SMA talks and and uh, number values and annual contributions, they also would include in their thinking, the rocks are also increasing their defense budget by X amount each year. They've got this number of troops helping to defend and deter on the alliance. They're you know increasing uh, arms purchases from U.S. weapons manufacturers. This was considered in sort of a holistic view. Well, I think policymakers in, in previous administrations, not just the Obama administration, uh, would not have let one set of negotiations over a very transactional issue become the centerpiece of the alliance and gain the profile it did and rise to the level of the president. Um, it's certainly important. It's cer certainly necessary to negotiate um, as much as possible with the South Koreans. Uh, but to let that be our entire view of the defense alliance, our entire view of the alliance as a whole is just completely absurd. Hmm. I want to circle back on a point you made about how it's been politicized and how it's sort of gone to the office of the president, right? because that's sort of outside how it was normally negotiated. But I also want to bring in uh, Yuki to this discussion and and just ask some of the brass tacks of U.S.-Japan cost sharing. So what I mentioned the structure with U.S. rock discussions and how it's sort of been in place roughly since 91. What is the current structure for cost sharing in the U.S.-Japan alliance? And Maybe how has it evolved over the last few decades as Tokyo has begun to more proactively reform its defense posture and its role in the alliance? So I think uh, essentially uh, both uh, SMAs, by that I mean a US Japan and US are okay, are designed and structured in a very similar manner. And uh, Japan, um, within uh, between US and Japan, they call, rather than SMA is a more formal name, but they basically call it host nation support. Mm -hmm. um, their HNS agreement is also, do also have those uh, three broad categories that, that you just referred to in a US ROC um, SMA. And at that, on those three categories, Japan actually pays almost 100% of the uh, salary of the uh, Japanese employees on the base. They pay 100% almost of the repair, repair maintenance cost on US bases. And any new construction or upgrading of the building that needs to be done on, on those, uh, Japan also pays a pretty fair share. And in addition to that, this, is, this kind of gets back to what Mintar was talking about. This um, host nation support negotiation is more of a total, takes a more of a total view of the uh, defense relationship as opposed to this, how many, how many Japanese yen, Japanese government is coughing us specifically tied to this name, is that back in the uh, 2004, 2005, um, U.S. and Japan uh, reached an agreement of relocation of a U.S. Marines into Guam, um, building the replacement facility that will be served, that, that will be used as the replacement for Futama Marine Corps, Air, uh, Marine Corps Air Station. So Japan pays about, I think a little bit over like 50% of the construction cost. And um, that also is, uh, that, that is actually an extra um, element that doesn't have a name of the host nation support, but then it does come into play when two governments sits down and talk about um, host nation support renewal. And like in very much the same way, um, US are, in the case of a USROK alliance, Japan procures a lot of American equipment through foreign military sales. So that gets added to the equation usually and uh, so basically, when you, once you start rolling up those numbers, um, it is in, just like in uh, 
our negotiations with the ROK, there's always a tension between us as in the United States wants Japanese government to pay more on that specific categories of a host nation support, whereas Japanese side wants to make that increase as minimal as possible because they're also under the pressure from their own finance ministry. So there's always that tension there. But in the past negotiations, those other categories that doesn't have the name, that, that's not technically included in host nation support, have always been kind of included in the American side of the consideration when two sides cannot exactly meet on the numbers, I mean, the Japanese yen numbers on the host nation support. Meaning like the Futenma replacement. And right, Futenma replacement cost, and that gets, that gets added in the minds of US. That's factored in, it's like an overall. Yeah. And then that's how, from what I understand, is that's how when, when I'm at the, uh, with the working level, as they goes rise up to the decision makers within the Pentagon, that's how it gets usually, you know, that, that's how it gets always explained. Mm. That this is where we are, this is how Japanese, how much Japanese government is willing to pay in the specific categories of host nation support. However, please do not forget that Japan already has paid this much for Guam relocation costs and in its own budget, this is how much they're spending on their acquisition out of which this much is the afford military sales that they're buying from us. Mm. So that's, how, that's how, I, how I understood that that's been always been explained to the senior level. And, and correct me if I'm wrong, but as I understand it, Japan, it's foreign military sales, about 90% of them come from the U.S. Is, is yes. that? And in the case yes. of Iraq, I think it's somewhere around like 75, 76%. It's also very high. Yeah. yeah, so basically over the years, um, the structure of the host nation support really hasn't changed that much. But as the Japanese economy grew, the ratio in which Japanese government pays for those categories had grow, had grown. And then now it's at the point where they're almost paying 100% of the local cost that's been dropped by, you know, that, that will be necessary to sustain and run the basic base operations okay. in the US, US bases in, throughout Japan. I see, so categories stay the same, but their contribution within them has right. increased. That has, that has definite, and then that also wasn't response from a Japanese government's reaction during the uh, trade friction was very high mm. in the 1980s and you know, or up to like 1980s, throughout the 1980s through the early 90s until the Japanese economy bubble bursted. Mm. So looking at what's currently happening between Washington and Seoul, they're at this impasse increasingly prolonged and thinking forward, what do you think the implications are um, for US-Japan talks? Obviously we have to add the sort of elephant in the room or the caveat that we have the November election here um, and it could be a second Trump term or it could be very likely a democratic administration um, led by a President Biden, most likely. So assuming say a second Trump term, how do you foresee things playing out um, once they begin to renegotiate those talks, which are due to be renegotiated in 2020? Right. Um, so I think one dynamics that are very different between current U.S.-Japan relations and the U.S.-ROK relations are the uh, personal relationship at the leadership level. Leadership mm -hmm. level. Clearly, Abe and Trump are, in a personally speaking, better terms. They just get along better. Mm -hmm. as opposed to President Trump and President Moon. Mm -hmm. And if the, uh, so basically Japanese, Japanese government has been obviously, they've been paying very close attention of how US ROK SMS is going down. And that is why they are doing working level preliminary talks bilaterally, but they're not gonna kick off official negotiations until after the presidential election. And Clint, you mentioned about this issue being politicized. The nightmare for Japanese side is that President Trump, while running, still running for re-election, try to use this as how, and yet another example of how he was able to get a good deal or better deal out of its allies. So even if they have to face second Trump administration, they want to wait until those election pressures off. And that's then to them, that's already easing that political pressure on the negotiations 
the, their hope is that President Trump will be too busy to think about the new agenda for his new administration. <laughs> that mm. Usually, like Mintaro said, SMA or host nations for negotiation really doesn't rise up to the uh, political attention by the president. Until it's and ready to be And then I think USROK Alliance, the, the SMA negotiation had this incredibly unfortunate timing of the renewal of the one-year stopgap fell right squarely in the middle of all this. And it was in the middle of impeachment. It was in the middle of um, political pressure on President Trump was, was basically picking up momentum. So I think it was just a, almost, almost a perfect storm that hit the both sides. Because clearly on DOD side and uh, their MND side, or also their MOFA and state, there's clearly at the, at the official level, they know how hard this is, but they've also always remember how they work this out in the end. But then I think in their particular case for the earlier this year or late last year and the earlier this year between Washington and Seoul, there is that extra political pressure added to the negotiators that it actually really hamstrung American negotiators hand to come up with more creative solutions that are explainable and sellable to President Trump and maybe Vice President Pence also. But then Japan, even if, even if they mean that they have to deal with the second Trump administration, they don't have that similar level of political pressure. So I would say it still will be a difficult negotiation, but it will be slightly easier for Japanese side to try to work with the US to come up with a little bit more creative solutions. Mm. And what of if Trump is not reelected and presumably we have a President Biden, how, how do you think that would look? A return to I mean, that will that will probably tremendously ease the pressure off of Japanese side. I think a lot of people will kind of inhale in sigh of relief uh -huh. that can we go back to this, you know, can we go back to this non-transactional um, tone that we've always taken when we're having these discussions. Interesting. Yeah, I think that's, and that's probably, I mean, Tara would be interested to know what you think, but that, I would think that's similar for, for U.S. South Korea relations as well, sort of a return to the status quo ante of this is the SMA structure. Yes, we might ask you to up your, your contribution within it, but we'll go back to this more strategic and holistic assessment of the alliance as opposed to dollars and transactions and just the SMA numbers. Um, so, Speaking of elections, we just had the National Assembly elections in South Korea. And I think this is one thing that um, is kind of played lip service to in DC, but not paid close enough attention to is how the domestic politics within South Korea and Japan as well, and in any other US alliance, can affect and constrain uh, alliances moving forward. And so we had the National Assembly elections, and of course, Moon Jae-in's uh, party, um, the ruling party, the Minjudang, won essentially an overwhelming majority, 180 seats, I believe. They went from about 123 to 180 seats. Um, and I'm curious, Mintaro, what's your read on the results of the National Assembly elections? And, and will it give the Moon administration more or less room to negotiate? I guess the, the, the proposition being that now that the elections are behind them, they've achieved the majority, in the National Assembly, are they maybe more comfortable to, to, to up the percentage contribution that they feel like they have a little more leeway to do that because they don't have to answer to voters? Or do you think it will harden their position to make them less willing? Um, the National Assembly has always been significant in agreements like this. In the, in the Obama era SMA, um, the opposition of elements of the National Assembly mattered. Um, and the scrutiny that they applied um, because um, the United States had not uh, spent surplus funds provided by South Koreans became an issue uh, in the negotiations at the time. Um, and um, now President Moon has a huge majority in the National Assembly. Uh, it's, a, it's an unusual mandate provided by the fact that um, he is seen to have responded well to the pandemic. Um, and so there are a lot of things that he and his party can do now. Um, that being said, I don't think that this will 
hugely change South Korea's negotiating posture or leverage uh, because the United States and Trump have made cost sharing an issue of sovereignty for the South Koreans. Um, and if there is any people or any country that is more concerned with issues of sovereignty, um, I don't know. I don't know who that could be because uh, the Koreans are very cognizant of the fact that they have been invaded repeatedly throughout history. That they are surrounded by bigger power, and as soon as something becomes an issue of sovereignty, it, um, they feel the need to to really defend themselves. But I don't think that. Um, just because President Moon has gained a larger majority in the National Assembly, it will give him uh, a huge amount of additional leverage. Hmm. So building on that and sort of looking a little even more closely at domestic politics, so conservatives generally, conservative, the conservative political party in South Korea, they are often and historically the most outspoken in support of the U.S. Rock Alliance. But with public perception being what it is now, particularly about the SMA, I mean, it being framed in, in terms of sovereignty, that they're being exploited or extorted by their, their, uh, the American ally. It makes defending the alliance an, a pretty unpopular public position. So it really doesn't pay to defend and support the alliance. So this, this has implications for a prolonged stalemate. How do you think this will, I mean, maybe this reinforces exactly what you were saying before. It, it reinforces the trend to harden their position but what implications do you think a longer stalemate would have for Alliance sort of trust moving forward when their most outspoken cheerleaders can't really be cheerleaders? Um, well, first of all, I'd point out that poll after poll has shown that um, a majority of South Koreans still believe in the value of the U.S.-Korea alliance. Um, and one recent poll, I think it was by the the Korean Institute of National Education uh, found that 96% didn't believe South Korea should pay more um, in the context of these cost sharing negotiations, but a large majority also still believed in the US Korea alliance. Mm -hmm. um, so I think um, it's not necessarily true that, um, that the problems with SMA will cause huge problems with the alliance. Um, that being said, um, at, as you kind of implied, if it's allowed to fester over a long period of time, if there's maybe a second Trump administration, if cost sharing and transactional issues continue to dominate the alliance and we don't, um, we don't focus on the things that uh, really provide breadth and depth to the alliance outside of cost sharing, uh, we could see sentiments start to change a little bit. So I might turn to Yuki with a similar question. Of course, this is fast forward in, um, in, in the not too distant future, but we know Prime Minister Abe, as you mentioned, he's, he's got good rapport with President Trump and it's something he's really fostered since early in the transition when he, when he flew over here almost immediately to hold meetings with President Trump, that he is a, is a strong supporter of the Alliance. The LDP historically has been as well. Um, how do other parties in Japan generally approach um, the, the, the US alliance, the CDP, the JCP, and the SDP, who I think are in a coalition, sort of the opposition coalition, um, with relatively few seats compared to the ruling coalition. How do you think domestic and electoral dynamics in Japan could affect those talks? Because again, they have their own general election in the fall of 2021, if, if not sooner. Um, how could that interact with the U.S.-Japan alliance and talks? So in terms of a domestic political um, dynamics, it is highly unlikely to see, let's say, opposition coalition win back the uh, government in the general election in October 2021. Uh, however, though, the public will see the uh, current Abe government's uh, response to uh, COVID-19 very carefully and his successor and in a, in a sense in a larger context um the ruling coalition so that's the liberal democrat party and a Komeito coalition will be judged by the voters so they are so i guess the question there would be not 
whether there are going to be a change of hands in the government. But then it's more about how many protest votes will, will go in to the opposition party. That um, does opposition party regain significant number of seats in the uh, lower house to make it, make it more difficult for the ruling coalition to get anything done legislatively. But for the moment though, except with the exception of a Japan Communist Party, um, pretty much all the other opposition party, even if they name, call themselves opposition, are not exactly anti-US alliance. Um, they're not posed against um, US, you know, United States or Japan have any alliance with the United States. So that, I don't see that dynamics change a lot, even with the election. However, uh, with combining, let's say currently uh, Abe government has been criticized heavily in the uh, flip-flop of its responses to the COVID-19, of whether that may be economic policy or social safety net policy or you know, transparency of the information or lack of clarity in their government guidances. And perhaps maybe some of those, you know, declaration of the state of emergency, some of those measures might have come a little too, you know, too little, too late kind of thing. That there will be a more scrutiny um, by the public and how ruling coalition continues to handle this ongoing public health emergencies. Mm -hmm. And depending on the economic impact that the current emergency ends up having on Japanese economy itself, it will definitely raise questions about um, how tolerate um, opposition party is willing to be in terms of Japan increasing the host nation support um, in the renewal of the host nation support. Because we're having, you know, we're suffering already this much domestically. Why, why do we, why do we, why do we throw more money, money at foreign troops in, in Japan? So some of those issues could perk up, and uh, just by having more opposition party seats in the lower house, makes it um, makes it uh, more difficult for the LDP Komeito ruling coalition to let's say push through those host nation support agreement for ratification and and um, having the, uh, there, there definitely will be more questions answered. I mean, questions asked under diet proceedings, especially when it comes to the budget season. Mm -hmm. And uh, that would be, that will be one thing to watch, but um, it is highly unlikely that the opposition party will regain power next, next year. Mm -hmm. But the margin of the seats that they currently have may may shrink, and how much it shrinks, it kind of depends on how Abe governments are continuing to respond to the COVID nineteen. Sure. And you raise, and you've both touched on it. Um, each respective Korean and Japanese government's response to the overwhelming factor we all face right now, which is COVID, which I. I you know, left out entirely from my introduction. It's like so ever present and so obvious. <laughs> I almost set it aside, but we can't do that. All of these talks and, and the questions I'm asking you are in this context of COVID and then post COVID, um, the sort of rolling post COVID and that the spillover and after effects of um, economically speaking of the pandemic. Um, one thing that in um, addressing the pandemic and, and so much analysis of what the implications of it are that has fallen out is relations between bilateral relations between Seoul and Tokyo. Of course, this created distinct difficulties um, in the second half of, well, for the last few years, but it sort of came to a crescendo in Seoul's uh, near um, removal from the Josomia agreement between the two countries. Um, that was, um, that outcome was negated um, near the end of last year, but there's still this ongoing um, sort of difficulty or disagreement between the two. How, and I'll ask each of you this, how, how do you think this will play out um, moving forward? Because there are, there are reasons, incentives for them not to worsen relations because of economic difficulties they're facing and the need for cooperation in dealing with 
um, all the after effects of the coronavirus. But what is your read with how things currently stand and how this might um, help bilateral relations between Seoul and Tokyo might um, may play out moving forward? I guess I'll, I'll ask Mintaro first. Um, sure. I, I think one reason uh, Korea-Japan relations have started to calm down a little bit um, with brief periods of tension is that both sides have major incentives for stability right now. Um, and we also see um, that when, when Korea or Japan have China as an option, when relations with China are better, um, that, um, that can have an impact. Um, so I, I can't imagine that the major issues that have caused tensions recently between South Korea and Japan will get resolved anytime soon. But I do see many reasons, uh, North Korea, um, the upcoming elections, uh, the current pandemic situation, um, all of those augur in favor of a need for stability and therefore a need to not escalate tensions too much in the Korea-Japan relations. Yuki, what's your take on that? So I tend to agree with um, Mintaro in the general sense that uh, there may be not a um, hopping incentive to improve the relationship, but the, but I think that currently with the, uh, or, um, with the uh, overarching tension at the political level, I think the whole problem uh, for the uh, both countries for the last several years is that everything that has to do with each other was politicized. And that's not how man the two countries have historically managed the differences over overall over very you know many important issues. The way they have been managed this relationship historically is to comp compartmentalize issue and deal with the issue by issue by issue and avoid at all costs politicizing any of those issues and bleed over and bleed over into the other area. And then I think for the last um, nine months or so, or you know, months surrounding South Korea almost pulling out of a GSOMIA, we saw we see that dangerous trend started happening. First, it started from export control, uh, Japanese uh, South Korean disagreement over how each other's export control authorities are enforcing its guidelines. And then that, that bled over into the uh, pullout of the GSOMIA issue, which is a bilateral military mil to military cooperation. And that dynamics has, um, has never happened before. And that was allowed to happen because of the overarching tension at the political level. But I think currently two, gov two government, at least at the official level, are very much at the place where let's go back to how we manage these differences before. So let's just stop silo the issues. If it's export control issues, we're gonna we're gonna pursue this on that on that you know counterpart counter, counterpart to counterpart consultation. Same thing for GSOMIA. Let's just leave that between Japan Ministry of Defense and uh, Ministry of National Defense on in Seoul side. So there is definitely incentive to have that relationship stable. And then especially because both countries have been heavily impacted by COVID-19, which basically originates from China. And that has a huge implication on their own bilateral relationship with China moving forward as well. And we have this interesting phenomena right now where uh, Japan and Korea uh, almost have the, uh, some, something called Donald Trump's political pressure as like almost like a common enemy to bat at. So they also have that, you know, much, much less incentive, incentive to continue to disagree, but rather to establish a bilateral relationship and see what happens in the elections and basically, you know, start over. Interesting. Yeah, that's the point you just made. I think it's Victor Cha's book. I think it came out of his doctoral dissertation. That was the underlying premise was that when there's uncertainty about the credibility of the U.S. commitment and staying power, we see tighter bilateral linkages between Seoul and Tokyo. And we may be in a second Trump term, right? This common, maybe not common enemy, but common concern, right? And 
a waning U.S. Uh, you know sort of commitment um, incentivizes settling these differences. Um, which brings up one final point that I want to get to before we we sort of close out, which is looking at each of these bilateral relationships in a larger regional context and China being the, in sort of the, the shadow of the ride, the proverbial rise of China and a, and a deepening U.S.-China strategic rivalry. And I want to ask you, Mentaro, first about when you were in state and maybe in conversations that you were having, um, not just with state officials, but also with maybe defense officials, how were the two alliances viewed in this context? Obviously, they're often put in comparative context as there's sort of similarities between these alliances, but there actually are some very stark differences in terms of the level of, um, on the military side of things, military interoperability and the sort of combined operations of the two alliances. And they, they, they have on the sort of the ground level, but then also how they might be conceived in this regional context. So I, I want to ask you, Mintaro, how were they, how were they viewed similarly, but also just as importantly, how were these two bilateral alliances viewed you differently? Well, one thing people really don't realize is that Japan and Korea are coming from wildly different places when it comes to China. Um, both have a certain amount of economic dependence on China, but Korea are far more so. Um, and uh, China is an immediate neighbor that it has to accommodate, especially when it comes to North Korea policy. And as much as Seoul reaffirms its commitment to the U.S. alliance publicly, like any regional actor, it has an interest in maximizing its options. Um, and that means cultivating relations with China. Um, so I think that it takes a much more nuanced, careful view of China uh, that is um, often more accommodating than uh, U.S. policymakers might be comfortable with. Um, I remember being in trilateral uh, discussions at the vice foreign minister, deputy secretary level with um, the U.S., Japan, and South Korea. And uh, the Japanese were very firm about countering uh, Chinese assertiveness in the South China Sea. Um, and the Koreans were much more wishy-washy about it. Um, so, so I think you definitely have to understand that um, the Koreans come at it from this different place and they are unlikely to adopt any sort of explicit balancing posture against China. But if we are smart about it, we can get them to do some sort of implicit balancing by um, adopting rules and st standards that are more favorable to the U.S. vision of the world. Um, as far as my outlook on the broader alliance going forward. Um, I have two main concerns uh, that, that might seem contradic contradictory. One is that um, we won't recognize the hugely tra transformational opportunity we might be able to get in the coming months with the US-Korea alliance and alliances more broadly. Um, I think that if there is a new democratic administration, there will be huge pushback against the Trump administration's transactional view of alliances and a renewed focus on their importance. And that will create huge opportunities for transformation in the alliance. And um, I'm concerned that if we're not strategic about it, we'll miss that opportunity. Um, on the opposite end of the spectrum, I'm worried that we have overly high expectations about what our alliances can do. Um, I think uh, because President Trump has been so transactional um, and so negative about our alliances that um, people have highlighted uh, the power of alliances more. And my concern is that a new administration will come in and uh, we will expect our alliances to be able to do a lot more uh, than they can uh, on a range of global issues. Um, we'll not recognize the limitations that they've always had and the, and the possibilities of bilateral tension. Um, and that we, we simply will not manage it well. Um, so those are really the two concerns I have going forward. If we manage them well, um, we can come out ahead. But if we don't, um, we will be very disappointed. Interesting. Um, Yuki, thinking about 
Ventura just shared a, a lot of different um, things that give food for thought, but thinking about um, the Japanese perspective of, of China um, and how its, its view, and as Mentaro highlighted in some of the meetings that he attended, they were a bit more outspoken or vociferous in what they saw as a threat coming from China. What I'm struck by on the one hand, as I was alluding to before, right, that the military interconnectedness of the U.S. Rock Alliance is really second to none in terms of the combined forces command, the interoperability of their forces, the history of their, um, <clears throat> excuse me, of their cooperation, the extent to which South Korea has fought in U.S. wars going back to Vietnam um, and, and moving forward. Whereas Japan, they don't have that same interoperability. And there are a lot of reasons for that. A lot of them are constitutional and political obstacles to Japan's own um, uh, military. But in other ways, Japan has been more um, upfront in its cooperation with, for example, like US regional you know, ballistic missile defense system sort of formally joining that system. And they've been more outspoken in terms of sort of uh, opening uh, navigation and sea lanes and the MSD, MSDF's involvement in, um, in sort of protecting Japan's sea lanes and going further and further from the Japanese Isles. What's your perspective of how Japan views its place in the U.S. Indo-Pacific strategy with China very much um, at its center? So a couple of points that I'll make on that. I think um, U.S. Japan Alliance and U.S. ROK Alliance have been structured differently as well. The U.S. ROK Alliance have really been born to, you know, primarily to defend South Korea from another invasion from the north. Yes, there is a little bit of, you know, regional aspect of it, but if you recall during the Noam Hyun administration, when Pentagon started talking about the regional deployments of the forces out of USFK and maybe how some of those forces that they've deployed to Iraq, they may not come back to you know, Korea at all. If you recall the upheaval that caused it, you know, caused in South Korea, that's kind of a testament of more of a primarily defensive na nature versus, versus uh, external threat that US ROK Alliance had. But then in a, say, in, in, a, in a sense, US Japan Alliance always had that regional aspect built in. Um, it was more built more as a political alliance. Yes, military, military is a very important component of it, but the alliance was more regional in nature, more political in nature, that it was more about US and uh, Japan standing with the United States and I guess the broader West vis-a-vis -vis back then, you know, communist bloc. And after the cold, after the cold war ended, the, in the mid 1990s, um, it was, it was part of it triggered by unfortunate event of the, uh, um, U.S. service members crime in Okinawa. But both government actually took that opportunity to transform the nature of the alliance into something that supports the liberal international order from what it used to be that it was against the communist bloc. And then I think that a fundamental shift has served the alliance well, that in the shortage of the types of a combined force structure that USROK has, or some of the limitations that Japanese self-defense force continue to have for the uh, political or constitutional or legal reasons, they have been able to compensate that by the by the uh, this fundamental shift that they made in their alliance, nature of the alliance. And I think moving forward, um, Japan will probably see itself as um, would like to see itself as an important um, important partner for the United States in its Indo-Pacific strategy. And uh, my concern is more about the dynamics between US and China, because currently Trump, Trump administration's uh, China approach is kind of a more of a mixed blessing, but more of a blessing for Japan. That for many Japanese policymakers, they feel like finally their American counterparts are seeing China threat as they see it. Now they're much more on the same, same page. During the Obama administration, there always has been constant concern that maybe they're, you know, maybe they're too concerned about overly antagonizing China and they may not be standing firm enough against, with us, you know, against Chinese um, misbehavior with us. So 
when the Trump administration came in and they started taking this really explicitly, I guess, hostile posture toward China, um, that gave a sign of, you know, kind of a sigh of relief for some Japanese policymakers. But because US-China relationship is such a complex bilateral relationship, and it has so much more component than Trump administration is lending itself to the dynamics that um, any change in those dynamic will impact Japan in a major, major way. And I think I'll give you one example that um, Japanese government were completely off, you know, caught off guard almost when President Trump went, went ahead and have a first Hanoi, um, for a Singapore summit with uh, Kim Jong-un. And the implication of their surprise was that they were very comfortable with the uh, US administration's like very um, hardline approach vis-a-vis -vis North Korea because they have their own bilateral issues too. But then if um, President Trump comes to some kind of a you know, broad agreement, which never came, so it was, it was never came to fruition. But if something like that happened, then they will be put in a position to almost having to start showing some flexibilities on their position, which they didn't want to, they didn't want to go. So I think my concern looking at US Japan dynamics is that how any major shift or in, how um, change in the US China uh, Chinese um, relations dynamic might be construed in Japan as the sign of, I guess, US softening its stance or US changing its stance. And what does that mean for, for the alliance? So I think that'll be my, cons uh, my uh, thing to watch moving forward. Thank you. Um, well, what's clear from all of this discussion, despite all the uncertainties and question marks, is that things aren't standing still in either of these relationships. They're moving forward, regardless of what administration is in office here. Um, so with that in mind, a question that is often asked um, when, we, uh, when we take programming to the Hill, which is what this is geared towards is, okay, thank you for the information. This is informative. What can Congress do? What, what concretely can Congress do? And so I might ask each of you, to give a recommendation, recommendation or two about what, what you think constructively um, Congress could do um, in relation to either or both of these relationships. And maybe start with you, Mon, uh, Mintaro. Uh, sure. Actually, I just wanted to, to briefly address that China point uh, because I can, I can still remember the Obama administration talking points on China, which is that Oh, there are there are elements of both uh, cooperation and competition in relations with China, and we have to expand the areas of cooperation and manage the areas of competition. Um, but my view is that uh, the Obama administration had a China policy that was softer in tone, but much more effective in countering China. Um, the Obama administration was uh, much more active in diplomacy with ASEAN. Uh, and and uh, in countering South China Sea assertiveness, um, it had TPP, which is probably the most substantive counterweight you could have uh, to China. Um, it cultivated relations with countries like Vietnam, um, and by not taking such an explicitly competitive stance, it it denied China the the high ground um, while still being able to take substantive. Um, policies that were fundamentally about countering China. Um, so that is something I would certainly defend from the Obama administration. Um, as far as what Congress can do, I think it should continue to issue sense of the Senate type of resolutions that reaffirm the value of the alliance and our commitment to our force posture in, in South Korea, uh, that we will not be withdrawing troops that that the Congress is fundamentally against doing that um, without at least close coordination with South Korea. Um, I think that members of Congress should also be active in promoting a broader view of the alliance, uh, pressuring the administration, whether this one or the next one, to engage South Korea on issues like health or the environment or something. Um, I think um, they could even legislate uh, 
uh, more appropriations to be able to to do things like that um, and um, and engage members of the executive branch to create new dialogues in those areas. I think those are all things that would benefit the U.S.-Korea alliance tremendously. And Yuki, your your takeaway recommendations for the Hill. Okay, so my re my recommendation will probably fall on a similar line. Um, I think the uh, resolution with expressing the sense of the importance of the alliance, I think that speaks widely. Um, I think for most of the um, um, American allies, not just Japan and uh, South Korea, but then across the world, has the um, basically the public is smarter about discerning what President Trump says and what how the rest of the government moves. And it's clearly the case in Japan that, you know, they're not crazy about President Trump, but then they're also at the same time, they understand that President Trump often talks before he thinks and the rest of the government actually may not necessarily follow. So you think so, that the wider public is, is okay. <laughs> so so some, some, many of the ally, uh, ally in allies, like even at the government level, they start kind of, you know, they have been dis making that distinction all along and that's how they manage the government to government relations, I think. Mm -hmm. But um, having that voice of, I guess, assurance from the Hill legislative branch, I think is an added reassurance, especially when, when you have a rhetorically, at least, very mm -hmm. unpredictable president at the top. And uh, when you look around, it's, um, it, I, will, I will look at Pentagon in the first place, that when Secretary Mattis left, there was a huge anxiety across the board of the alliance managers within Japanese government, mm -hmm. because to them, Secretary Mattis kind of symbolized like, you know, voice of reason that could, that could say no if President Trump makes very unrealistic or unwise demand. But when he went, the anxiety really increased that, you know, they almost lost a protector of the alliance level. So I think um, having, having Congress fill that role of check and basically exercising check and balance of executive branch, I think is a huge assurance for the, uh, for the uh, you know, not just Japan and South Korea, but then I think I would say all the uh, American allies and partners. Well, we've gone over what I wanted to do for a lot of time, but the reason is because the, the material itself, the issues lend themselves to extensive discussion. And of course, we, we could go on much longer. Um, but we'll stay within reasonable bounds. I want to thank you both, Mintaro and Yuki, for joining me for this, this conversation. This allows us to, again, like I said, put some of the more narrowly Korea-focused discussion in a wider context, and will also be made available to uh, the same uh, Hill offices, both House and Senate. So thank you again, and I look forward to, of course, future conversation and engagement with both of you. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.